Good morning. My name is Matt, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Lindsay Corporation First Quarter Fiscal Year 2021 Earnings Call. All participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing star then zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on a touch tone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. During this call, management may make forward-looking statements that are subject to the risks and uncertainties which reflect management's current beliefs, estimates of future economic circumstances, industry conditions, company performance, and financial results. Forward-looking statements include the information concerning possible or assumed future results of operations of the company, and those statements preceded by, followed by, or including the words expectation, outlook, could, may, should, or similar expressions. For these statements, we claim the protections of the safe harbor for forward-looking statements contained in the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. I would like now to turn the call over to Mr. Randy Wood, President and Chief Executive Officer. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Appreciate you joining us. With me on today's call is Brian Ketchum, our Chief Financial Officer. Before Brian gets into the details of our first quarter results, I do want to share some opening comments. We announced our CEO transition plan in November, and I'm pleased to confirm that Tim Hassinger and I have now fully completed the transition, and it's my pleasure to join you this morning as President and CEO of Lindsay Corporation. I want to acknowledge and thank Tim for his full support, not only during the transition, but the key role he played in the transformation of our company. It truly is a pleasure and an honor to lead this great organization and continue our path forward. We continue to follow CDC safety protocols at all of our facilities as part of our pandemic response plan. Our businesses are classified as business essential and all nine plants are operational and running. We're also maintaining our work from home option for roles that can be performed remotely. Safety is a non-negotiable expectation for us, so we'll continue to make decisions that keep our employees safe. Turning to the business environment, conditions in North American irrigation market improved rapidly during the quarter Commodity prices strengthened significantly due to an improvement both in supply and demand fundamentals, including an increase in exports linked to the Phase 1 China trade deal. Record government support to help offset the ongoing impact of the coronavirus and trade disputes early in the year further supported positive customer sentiment and improvements in grower profitability. USDA projections now show a 43% increase in 2020 net farm income on a year-over-year -year basis. In late December, the President signed the Coronavirus Direct Aid Package that allocated an additional $13 billion to the egg sector, and we expect that aid to provide supplemental support for the corn, soybean, livestock, and dairy sectors. These positive market drivers drove stronger-than-expected order flow in the second half of the quarter in North America, leading to higher equipment sales and a large order backlog at the end of the quarter. We also saw rapid escalation of input costs, primarily steel, during the quarter and some transportation disruptions that resulted in higher expediting fees. Large influx of orders coupled with increased costs have put short-term pressure on margins. Price increases have been passed through to the market and we expect to see margin pressure subside as the year progresses. International irrigation showed solid results on a year-over-year -year basis with unit volume growth across most regions. Brazil continues to perform well due to strong farm income, favorable currency for exports, and a record soybean yield. Government subsidized financing continues to support market growth, and we're seeing expansion in private banking options as well. In technology and innovation, we were pleased to announce our partnership with Terranus, the market leader in high-resolution economic imagery, and Microsoft, which will allow us to deploy machine learning and artificial intelligence to create the smart pivot. The combination of advanced agronomics and machine health monitoring within the integrated FieldMap platform will be an industry first and further strengthens our position as the innovation leader in mechanized irrigation. Moving to infrastructure. We continue to focus on uh, growing the road zipper business by executing our shift left strategy, increasing our global penetration, and growing the lease business. We did see an increase in road zipper lease revenue in the quarter, and our road zipper sales funnel continues to improve on a year-over-year -year basis. The timing of projects exiting the funnel remains challenging to predict, particularly in this current pandemic environment. Both road safety and road zipper projects face short-term headwinds as governments have delayed road construction projects while managing their pandemic response. The recent COVID relief package did provide additional funding to the states, which we expect will be beneficial for spring projects. 
President-elect Biden has also expressed a desire to support an infrastructure bill shortly after assuming office, so we do see the potential for supportive news later in the year. The Road Zipper project with Highways England is now fully deployed and operating well, and we expect this should become a great case study that supports further penetration of Road Zipper and similar applications. Now I'll turn the call over to Brian to review our first quarter financial results. Thank you, Randy, and good morning, everyone. Total revenues for the first quarter of fiscal 2021 were $108.5 million, compared to $109.4 million in the same quarter last year. Net earnings for the quarter were $7.1 million, or 65 cents per diluted share, compared to net earnings of $8.3 million, or 77 cents per diluted share in the prior year. Net earnings for the quarter included an income tax benefit of approximately $1.7 million, or $0.16 cents per diluted share, related to the release of a valuation allowance in a foreign tax jurisdiction. Irrigation segment revenues of $87.4 million for the first quarter increased $4.1 million, or 5%, compared to $83.3 million in the same quarter last year. North American irrigation revenues were $52.8 million, compared to $53.6 million in the same quarter last year. The decrease resulted primarily from lower engineering services revenue related to a project in the prior year that did not repeat, and this was partially offset by higher irrigation equipment unit volume. In the international irrigation markets, revenues of $34.6 million increased $4.8 million, or 16%, compared to $29.7 million in the same quarter last year. Increase resulted from higher unit sales volumes in several regions, which were partially offset by the unfavorable effects of differences in foreign currency translation rates compared to the prior year that totaled approximately $2.4 million. Total irrigation segment operating income for the first quarter was $10.6 million, an increase of 9% compared to $9.8 million in the same quarter last year. An operating margin improved to 12.2% of sales compared to 11.7% of sales in the prior year. Improved margins were supported by higher irrigation equipment sales volume. However, this improvement was tempered somewhat by the impact of higher raw material costs and also from higher freight costs that resulted from reduced availability of commercial trucking resources. Market prices for all types of steel products began to rise rapidly during the quarter, with steel coil prices increasing over 70% from September to the end of December. While we have implemented pricing actions to pass through these cost increases, a large number of irrigation equipment orders were received prior to these actions taking effect. We expect to see some uh, margin headwinds in our second quarter as the backlog of orders received prior to the price increases are shipped. Infrastructure segment revenues for the first quarter were $21.1 million compared to $26.1 million in the same quarter last year. The decrease resulted primarily from a large road zipper system order delivered in the prior year that did not repeat and from lower road construction activity in the current year. Infrastructure segment operating income for the first quarter was $4.3 million compared to $8.7 million in the same quarter last year. Infrastructure operating margin for the quarter was 20.1% of sales compared to 33.5% of sales in the prior year. This decrease is primarily due to lower revenue and higher margin product lines and was also impacted by an increase in raw material and other costs compared to the prior year. Turning to balance sheet performance and liquidity, during the quarter, we generated free cash flow of almost $10 million, representing 138% of net earnings. Our total available liquidity at the end of the first quarter was $196.4 million with $146.4 million in cash and marketable securities and $50 million available under our revolving credit facility. Our total debt was $115.9 million at the end of the first quarter, 
almost all of which matures in 2030. Additionally, at the end of the quarter, we were well within the financial covenants of our borrowing facilities, including a funded debt to EBITDA leverage ratio of 1.5 compared to a covenant limit of 3.0. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to the operator to take your questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchstone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Brian Drab with William Blair. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, first question is just on, on the road zipper pipeline. Um, so in, in the last fiscal year, you know, large projects totaled over 50 million in, in revenue. And, and I'm wondering if you can, you know, give us your, your latest update for, as you look out to the, the next fiscal year, um, you know, the potential for, for large project revenue uh, this year, what's the latest estimate? Yeah, Brian, um, thanks for the question. Yeah, in, um, we've got, I would say, pretty good visibility this year to um, several, what, what I would classify as mid to large projects. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned last year, we were 50 million um, or slightly over in road zipper projects, um, with 27 million of that being the Highways England project. Um, you know, I think our visibility right now would indicate that um, we would cover probably about half of that Highways England um, project with the current um, visibility that we have. Okay, do you think overall for the year that it could be uh, like a, a 25 plus or 30 million plus large project revenue though for you know, in total for, for any projects that you have or is it gonna be kind of below that, that range? You know, I, I think right now it would look that, um, you know, depending on what you know how the timing works out that it would be above the 30 above the 30 million okay great thanks and and uh you know as you take that into account um you know that the, that there will be you know solid pr uh, large project revenue but somewhat down from last year and you know then on the on the uh, positive and that's high relatively high margin business but then on the positive side you have you know um pretty good outlook here for irrigation and good leverage in that business. So overall, um, what direction do you think gross margin goes, uh, you know, for in, in uh, the next fiscal year? Well, I think um, two things on that point. Um, obviously, yeah, the irrigation outlook is much improved over what it was last year. And, and um, you know, after a record year in infrastructure, um, you know, that's hard to replicate. So the mix, um, of business is a little lower operating margin on the infrastructure, or I mean on the irrigation side, but obviously as you, as you know, uh, increase in volume, you know, levers pretty well on the irrigation side. So, you know, I think based on if commission, or if conditions remain where they're at today, um, you know, from a total, uh, you know, profitability standpoint, I think we could replicate last year margin um, you know, operating margin percentage could could be a little bit lower but total profitability you know could be at or above last year um, so sorry total uh, operating margin could be consolidated operating margin you're saying could be a little bit lower than it was in fiscal 20 yeah just because of the, the change in mix right I understand just want to make sure I heard it correctly. Okay, thanks very much. Our next question will come from Nathan Jones with Stiefel. Please go ahead. Morning, everyone. Morning, Nathan. Just a uh, follow-up there on Brian's last question and a clarification. Brian, you said operating margin percentage could be down a bit, but the operating income could be higher than last year? Yeah, uh, Nathan, I, you know, predicated that on, you know, if, if the ag conditions that we're seeing today remain, you know, through the year, which we have no reason at this point to think they won't, um, 
you know, we, with irrigation having a solid year, um, we could definitely get to that point. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, raw material prices and, and at that, its impact on margins. You really only saw steel prices start to spike up, you know, four or five months ago, uh, which if I recall correctly is, you know, about how long it takes you to run it through your inventory anyway. So I wouldn't have thought you guys, certainly in the, in the fiscal first quarter, should really have been recognising any of that increased steel pricing um, running through the P&L. Can you talk about how that plays out in terms of, you know, what of the increased raw material prices you've already recognised? I would have th thought that that pricing would uh, would be getting a little bit worse as we go forward here over the next quarter or two. And then also how that plays off with the price increases that you put in. Have you put in enough price increases to cover all of the increase in raw materials or do we need to go back to the market with, with more price increases? Yeah, Nathan, this is Brian. Um, you know, we really saw the the steel cost increases beginning in, in September and then, you know, really taking off starting in October. Um, you know, when you compare that to the order flow that we saw, um, you know, our order flow started picking up in the last, um, I'd say the last half of October. And, um, and so, you know, with, um, I think the automobile industry picking up, uh, availability started becoming an issue and supply on the steel side. So that really led to the rapid increase in steel costs. Um, we had a fall order program that went through the end of October and our steel price increases started taking effect uh, first of November. So, you know, where we're at today, we've implemented several price increases to where it's, you know, I would just say double digit kind of range, which, uh, which would cover the steel cost increase that we've seen. Uh, okay, thanks, I'll pass it on. Our next question comes from Ryan Connors with Benning and Scattergood. Please go ahead. Great, thanks for taking my questions. A um, couple, couple of bigger picture questions. First, um, you mentioned, the, Randy, the, uh, the Biden administration and, and the infrastructure spend and so forth. Um, but, but I wondered if the, you could comment on another uh, priority that they've mentioned, maybe less prominently, which is the equip funding, you know, the, the sort of environmental program where they give some low cost money for irrigation and other uh, agricultural uh, issues. Have you heard uh, any more details on that, whether that's something that you think is going to be real and whether that um, you know, tilts the balance of wallet share towards irrigation, uh, even in a good ag market? Yeah, thanks for your question, Ryan. And I, I do think you're right. The uh, the administration obviously is going to have a significant focus on the environment, DSG, sustainability, and the Equip program has proven to be uh, a very efficient means of getting capital to the market, where customers are going to use it to improve efficiency. I think one of the big changes that we've seen uh, in the last Farm Bill was the ability to fund technology investments like FieldNet Advisor. So I think going forward, we should see strong financial support in the EQUIP program, which will aid in full machine conversions to more efficient means of irrigation. Uh, but we're also uh, excited that, that it'll include technology investments as well that will allow growers with pivots to buy into technologies that will also save time, uh, water, and energy. So we see EQUIP as a, as a good tailwind going forward. Okay, okay. And then sort of a segue from that, um, you talk about these big raw material price increases and that necessitating, you know, product price increases. How does that impact a farmer's a customer's decision on, you know, whether to, to put a new pivot in place or whether to try to augment technology and, and sort of fix up the, their older uh, base equipment and sort of augment technology on top of it, um, you know, to just sort of get the most out of what they have if it's, if it's going to cost that much more to actually put a new piece of metal in the field yeah when we we look at the impact on, on pricing and maybe elasticity of, of new machine purchases versus upgrades technology add-ons even uh, even a double digit double digit increase in the quarter is pretty significant over the short term but if you look at the you know the total acquisition cost the impact on yield and, and profitability we don't see that driving uh, a lot of purchase decisions towards upgrades or, or just technology add-ons particularly with what we're seeing in, in commodity prices and the strength of net farm income. So we don't see the, uh, 
the, the cost increases passing through as pricing increases on the equipment having a significant impact. Our perspective is they're going to continue to make investments that impact their bottom line, and that's going to include full machines uh, and technology add-ons. Got it. Okay. And then my last one was um, kind of switching gears to infrastructure, and really a big picture question. You know, you talked about the positive impact of infrastructure spending, but I saw an interesting quote from, I guess, uh, a transportation planning uh, person down at Texas A&M, pretty prominent person, who who made a comment that. Um, Basically, with people working from home at least part of the time, it's going to be as if every highway in the country had a lane added to it um, during rush hour, which I thought immediately brought to mind sort of the, the road zipper because, you know, the, the, the case has always been to just kind of add a lane. So um, I don't know if you heard that comment or not, but interested to get your take on that angle that, that you know, maybe we get some infrastructure spending, but how does that sort of potential for lower density on the roads impact the, the road zipper, um, you know, business case? I think there, there's going to be a, a lot of questions about what uh, the post-pandemic environment is, uh, is all about and, and whether we see a continuation of work from home. Is it, is it a hybrid environment? And if you look at the, the volume of traffic that we see on the nation's highways, there's always going to be a mix of uh, commercial traffic and, and trucks moving uh, goods coast to coast and, and people that are that are driving to and from work, people that are uh, shopping. And I think as the economy starts to pick back up again and, and life returns to, to a new normal, that we're going to see uh, traffic trends that, that maybe don't get you know, all the way back to what we've seen uh, in, a, in a pre-COVID environment. But I think we were, we were stressed on our nation's roadways. And we know that we're a little behind on infrastructure spending. There's going to be some pent-up demand there. So I wouldn't view... Uh, that Ryan is, is having a significant impact on our ability to continue growing that, that road zipper funnel and, and growing that road zipper business. Got it. Uh, very helpful. Thank you. Happy New Year to everybody and uh, congrats on the new role, Randy. Great. Appreciate it, Ryan. Thank you. Our next question comes from John Bratz with Kansas City Capital. Please go ahead. Um, good morning, Randy. Uh, Brian. Morning, um, John. You guys mentioned that. Uh, Irrigation orders picked up in the second half of the uh, of the quarter, and since the end of November, grain prices have improved even further. Corn and soybeans are up about 16%. Did you see the pace of activity change uh, or accelerate um, in in the month of December versus sort of the second half of of the quarter? Have you seen an improvement in in order rates? Yeah, John, it's, it's been a slow, steady, continuous improvement in, in market conditions. And if you track commodity prices, certainly the, the last um, coronavirus relief package announcement right at the end of, of December, there's been a lot of positive indicators that pile on top of each other that have really led to uh, continued improvement in customer sentiment. So when we look at our order intake rate in irrigation, we did see uh, that same acceleration from September, October, November through through December. So those uh, those market conditions, the positive customer sentiment, we've seen that continue uh, right through December. Okay. You know, uh, w would you uh, disclose your backlog at at the end of December <laughs> versus where you were at the end of the quarter? Oh, at the end of December. Now, um, you know, we we uh, obviously shipped out. Some of the yep. quarter end back on, but uh, what I will say, you know, I mean, year over year, obviously, it's is a, a large increase, right? And uh, um, you know, compared to where it was last year, but you know, we're seeing you know, just it put a little more color around the backlog. I mean, it's a uh, within irrigation equipment, um, it's well over a 50 percent increase year over year, okay? Okay, thanks, Brian. And then, secondly, um uh, the expense ratio, SG&A expense ratio, was was higher than I was looking for. Um, anything in there uh, unusual? Was, were there any transition costs with Tim's retirement uh, uh, recorded in the quarter? Anything, any color on the uh, on the level of SG&A costs? Yeah. No. Just first of all, in terms of um, you know transition costs, nothing significantly there. We did have you know the the COO COO role for a quarter, which we didn't have. Um, you know, before and mm -hmm. we don't have going forward, but you know that wasn't that significant. But uh, you know, I think the biggest thing um, was really timing and how we uh, 
kind of booked our incentive accrual this year versus last year. Um, first quarter last year was was pretty low, and then as we went through the year, we, you know, increased that as the infrastructure business grew. Um, you know, I think the other thing uh, driving, you know, we had higher selling expenses in irrigation in the first quarter. A lot of that was um, marketing related, um, and directed towards the new new product launches that we've introduced. Mm-hmm. So. Um, you know, year-over-year year increase, but nothing uh, okay. uh, how, structurally. Uh, Brian, how, how much was sort of the, the, the delta in the incentive accrual for the quarter? Uh, that was, uh, when you look at corporate, which, which was up about $1.1 yep. $1. 1 um, that would be the large majority of that. Okay. Uh, also, a little bit on the irrigation side. So, yep. in total, that was probably more than half of the increase. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chris Shaw with Moness Cresty. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Morning, Chris. Morning, Chris. Um, international irrigation was uh, up strongly, and I think you guys cited Brazil as a, a strong market still. How are the other international markets? You know, I, I would assume still with COVID going on that there's a lot of delays and in markets that are sort of maybe more government-driven or I don't know, quite institutional-driven. Um, is that the case still? And I, I assume the the Brazilian market is is probably is it as seasonal as the U.S. market is, or is that different there? Yeah, I think when we look at the international markets, Chris, and, and you break it up into the what we define as more mature markets, and and they operate like North America does, with with some supply and demand fundamentals, farm income fundamentals, and markets like Brazil, like Australia, New Zealand, certainly uh, portions of, of Western Europe. And they're they're being supported and, and propped up by some of the same fundamentals in, in global commodity prices. So we saw almost uh, across the board improvement in, in a lot of those more mature markets. In the emerging project-oriented markets, those ones have have a mix of business. Some of that will be commodity price net farm income driven, and some of it will be supported by government investments. And that's an area where we've seen more interest in projects. And, and we've talked about this before the, the COVID crisis and the shutdown of borders really identified for some countries they've got more risk than they're comfortable with. So we are seeing more discussion, inquiries on, on projects in those areas. Um, but in markets where we, we do have that mix and we see some strong egg fundamentals, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing business growth there as well. And the only area internationally where we, we saw more headwind was really in, in sub-Saharan Africa and in South Africa specifically where the, uh, the market fundamentals uh, are not incredibly weak but we've got some some political unrest overlays really limiting uh, capital investment in that part of the world. But when we look internationally, we see uh, we see pretty good growth uh, quarter over quarter in, in most parts of the world. Uh, your second question on Brazil, we do have some seasonality there, but they uh, they benefit from having multiple crops per year. So they'll they'll that's have true. a cycle that's planting, growing, harvesting, then they'll jump right back into planting. So. There is some seasonality. It just comes uh, a little quicker there than maybe we see in the, the markets in the northern hemisphere where we only have one growing season. And do you handle the rising steel costs similarly in the international markets as you do domestic, or is it a sort of different negotiation with the customer there? It's uh, it's a very similar process. Oh, got it. Uh, and then something more, I don't know, not theoretical, but in terms of irrigation in the U.S., in terms of, uh, you know, there's, off and on, there's talk about water restrictions or maybe putting a greater economic cost on water supplies, whether it's aquifer or uh, something else. But do you have any sense? I always understood that to be more of maybe a local decision, or maybe state-based or something. But, you know, with the Biden administration, is there a chance that there could be a, a, a larger federal effort to, I don't know, again, put some sort of economic cost on water supplies for farmers? Or is there any – do you have any – I guess, insight or, you know, foresight into that? Yeah, I, I would say, Chris, we don't have any uh, inside knowledge, uh, no official perspectives. I think it's uh, it's an area that remains to be seen. And, and you read a lot about um, wanting to recognize the true economic cost of water in, in business models where, where water is consumed, but there's nothing that we've seen uh, indicated of the administration at this point that, that we could use to really give you a good fact-based answer to your question. Got it. Thank you. As a reminder, if you have a question, please press star than one to be joined into the queue. Our next question is a follow-up from Nathan Jones with Stiefel. Please go ahead. 
Hey guys, I just want to uh, follow up a little bit on the backlog increase, you know, 50%. It is a pretty slow period seasonally for you guys. So, it, you know, it doesn't take huge numbers probably to move that backlog around. It can be impacted by the timing on the harvest, you know, and when the buying season starts. Were there any other factors, you know, impacting where you where the backlog, you know, ended at the end of November that are worth noting in terms of uh, of those time, maybe a timing impact from the harvest or anything like that that we should be aware of? Uh, Nathan, this is Brian. I, you know, I think, you know, potentially a couple of things that, you know, you could say maybe pull some orders forward. One would be if there's year-end tax buying, you know, to uh, shelter some of the farm income. Um, you know, that's, I don't know that we can really quantify that. And then I think as steel prices starting starting to increase, I think, you know, some of the orders I'm sure came in, um, you know, trying to beat the price increases. Um, mm, but clearly, fair enough. You know, I think with, uh, you know, lead times starting to extend out, I think uh, we are seeing a, a little bit more of a shift, um, you know, into our second quarter that maybe, you know, Last year would have been in the third quarter. At this point, it's really hard to say. I mean, we'll see as, as uh, you know, the year plays out. But clearly, the, okay, then. You know, the under, underlying fundamentals uh, that Randy mentioned are, you know, really the primary driver behind the uh, order flow and backlog. Got it. Um, and then, you know, you talked about having put through double-digit price increases, you talked about robust unit demand, increases in technology purchases. I'm just trying to trying to get some idea or some sizing of how we should think about the revenue growth uh, as we're going forward here. I mean, I, you can have some pretty big swings in revenue in, in this business uh, as things go. But are, are we talking about, you know, mid-teens or better going forward kind of revenue growth as an expectation? How long does it take before these double-digit price increases actually bleed through into the P&L? Uh, just to try and give us some idea of, of what kind of growth we should be expecting here going forward. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, second quarter is definitely going to be, you know, stronger year over year. If you were to project this out on a full year basis, I, I would say mid-teens is, is a reasonable expectation. Um, you know, in regards to when the headwinds start to subside, I, I would expect, um, you know, I would estimate, you know, up, Close to 40% of our backlog at the end of the quarter would have been orders received prior to the price increases. So, you know, by the time we get through the um, you know, second quarter, I would say we'd have the headwind, you know, behind us. Excellent. Thanks very much. Our next question comes from Bill Baldwin with Baldwin Anthony Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, just a couple of Housekeeping questions. Uh, do you have a projected tax rate uh, for fiscal 21 at this time or attractive you know, range for tax rate? Yeah, Bill. Um, you know, what we would expect for the balance of the year would be, uh, you know, around 23 and a half, which puts us a little bit over 20% for the full year. Okay. And, and what are your current cap capital expenditure projections for the full year? Similar to last year, or do you have any particular projects ongoing there? And expectations would be um, probably close to $20 million for the year. Okay. And then lastly, can you uh, offer some color on what uh, your, uh, what's going on, what you're doing with your non-road zipper uh, infrastructure business, you know, your road safety products, your guardrail, your end cushions, uh, Looks like you've got a pretty good product line up in that area. And uh, I'm just wondering, you know, how many states are you currently operating in and what are your plans for that business uh, domestically or and or internationally? Yeah, Bill. Um, yeah, the road, road safety products business, um, as you mentioned, crash cushions in, in Europe. We've got a uh, temporary tape business, um, really, you know, both driven around you know, the road construction activity or there's replacement business as well. But we just went through a, a full product refresh over the last couple of years to uh, update to the new MASH standard. So as part of that process, um, you know, we've made some product enhancements that, have, you know, I think have been received very well in the marketplace. And, and we started to see, um, 
uh, some pretty good growth in the road safety products. You know, this most recent quarter, um, you know, we said that road safety products were down a little bit, and that's really tied to the, the slowdown in construction activity that we've seen, um, you know, most of which we think is, is COVID-related. Do you currently operate in, in most of the lower 48 states in that business, or in the states that you want to operate in, I should say, or do you have room for expansion as a addressable market here domestically? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's the states that we want to operate in. I, it's not, um, um, I don't know the exact number offhand, but there's, uh, you know, certainly uh, um, some key states that, that we uh, uh -huh. focus on. But, you know, there's, there's always room to expand into the other states. It's just the incremental, um, you know, business that you get isn't going to be as much in certain states. Right. And roughly what, what percent, if you disclose this, of your infrastructure business comes from non-zipper type products, you know, the road safety products? Um, you know, we haven't broken it out in the past, but it's been, um, you know, more than 50% of the business is has been non-road zipper. Last year, okay. obviously, was a very, very strong road zipper year. Right, right. Very good, very good. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Yep, thanks for your question. At this time, there appears to be no more questions. Mr. Wood, I'll turn the call back to you for closing remarks. Thank you very much for your interest and participation today. This does conclude our first quarter earnings call. We look forward to updating you on our continued progress following the close of our fiscal 21 second quarter. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.